Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, ugly number two. We've already solved the first one. I think that was a few years ago. I do have a video for that, but this problem is definitely pretty similar. So an ugly number is defined as being a number that has a prime factor of one of these. So we're given an integer n and we wanna return the nth um, ugly number. So that would basically mean taking all ugly numbers, like the first 10 of them at least, and that's kind of what they've done over here. So just to draw that a little bit bigger, you see we have the numbers one, two, three, four, five. We start with one, even though one technically doesn't have a factor of any of these. That's kind of the base case. And then you can think of it this way, like you can take this number and then multiply it by two and then get this number. You can multiply it by three and get this number, or you can multiply it by five and get the number over here. And then for two, you can do the same thing. Multiply it by two, and then you'll get four. Multiply it by three, you'll get six. Multiply it by five, and you'll get 10. You can kind of just keep going with the smallest number uh, doing it this way. So this, like what I'm doing right now, believe it or not, is the intuition for one of the solutions I'm gonna show you. So now we go to three, do the same thing, multiply it by two, we get six, but six is already seen, right? So we don't want duplicates, so ignore that. And then with this three, multiply it uh, by three, which gets us to nine, and multiply it by five, which gets us to 12. And then do the same thing with four, multiply it by two, get eight, multiply it by three, get 12, multiply it by five and get 20. But at this point, we've already seen the first 10 numbers, but just in case, you know, we could still keep going through them in order until we've seen exactly 10 of them because the way that we generate them is somewhat out of order. You can see that with three, we generated six, nine, and 12, I believe. Actually, I don't think we did generate 12. I think we generated 15. My math is definitely off, so please ignore that. The point I'm making is that some of them, like this one, might be skipped before we are able to generate these. We might generate some that come after it. So after generating those, we see that the parameter is 10. We've generated the 10th one, so this is what we would return. That is the result for the first example. So knowing that, how can we kind of do this problem in a brute force way? Well, one solution definitely is to do backtracking, recursive backtracking, starting with one, generate two, three, five, and then kind of keep doing that. There is a potential uh, solution to do this. With this, we could possibly go to a depth of n, and then among all the numbers that we generated, we could have put them into a list. We could sort that list. That's not gonna be very efficient. It's gonna be at least three to the power of n, probably or maybe even worse than that with the sorting. But if we can get to a solution that gets us the first 10 integers without doing that kind of recursive brute force, let's see if we can do that. Remember, one is gonna be the first choice. It's always gonna be the first uh, ugly number. So then the next ones that we wanna generate, we already intuitively know it's gonna be two multiplied by that, right? So it's gonna be two. Now at this point, things get a bit more interesting. From here, we probably wanna try two, which would get us to four. We could try three, but from here, we can multiply this still by three, which would get us three, or we can multiply it by five, which would get us five. So this kind of feels almost like a graph problem where we wanna choose the minimum from the frontier of all of our choices. A good data structure for doing that is a priority queue or a minimum heap. So that's exactly how we're gonna solve this problem. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna initially have one on the minimum heap. We're gonna pop it. We're gonna say, okay, this was the first ugly number. And then with that number, we're gonna multiply it by all three factors that we have. So we'll get two, three, and five. And now this is what's gonna be in our heap. Among these, we pop the minimum, which is two. So now from here, we're gonna multiply it by two, three, and five, which would give us four and 10. Now all these are gonna be added to the heap. We're gonna pop the minimum, which is gonna be three. And so now we'll do the same thing with this. We'll have three numbers we multiply it by. So we'll have six, nine, and 15. But remember that this is a duplicate. So a good way we could eliminate these is by using some kind of hash set which keeps track of what we've already pushed to the heap so that we don't end up with duplicates. It wouldn't be the end of the world if we pushed a duplicate on here, but if we pop it, we wanna make sure that we don't um, you know, track both of these as separate elements. So with everything that we're popping up until this point, we can keep track of them, or at least keep track of how many we've popped. And then once we get to N, uh, the 10th number, that's the one that we're gonna end up returning. So we could continue going with this, and I guess I will quickly. So right now the minimum is gonna be four. We can multiply it to get eight, 12, and 20. Next we'll pop five. It'll have a bunch, then we'll pop six. 
then we'll pop eight. And, you know, eventually we're going to pop 12. I don't know if I've done it in the correct order. I think that's four, three. Yeah, I think that's 10. So something like that. We'll end up getting this. So this is a valid solution. You can tell that the time complexity we're going to be popping from the heap is n times. And the complexity of doing that is going to be log n because the size of the heap is never going to grow past uh, three times the number that we have popped. Because every time that we pop an element, we're only adding three more elements for each one so it'll always be proportional to n space complexity is obviously going to be o of n as well so i'm going to start out with the minimum heap it's just going to have one initialized with it we're going to have a visit hash set so that's pretty simple and the way to code this up a little bit easier is going to be with a, a nested loop so i'll show you that in a second so first we know we're going to do this n times we're going to pop from the heap n times because after we pop an element we consider that to be the nth ugly number. So once we get to the last iteration, that's when we will return. So let me just have that if n is equal to, or if rather i is equal to n minus 1, that's when we are going to return the ugly number. So here we're popping, so min heap, well, we do it like this, heap q dot heap pop from the min heap, and then we'll get the number. So let me just call that num. So if this is the nth number that we've popped, let's return the num. Otherwise, we want to take that number and for all of our prime factors, we want to multiply it. So this is where I'm going to use the nested loop. It's not necessary, but it makes it easier to code up because we're going to have to check before we push each element to the heap that if it's already been visited. So that's easier to do with a loop. So just like this for F in factors for every single factor, we want to uh, multiply the number by the factor. And if this is already in the visit hash set, then we want to skip. So let's check that this is not in the visit hash set. If that's the case, let's add it to the visit hash set num times f. And let's also push it to the heap, heap q, heap push to the min heap num times f. So we don't need a return statement out here because we're guaranteed that this is going to execute at some point. So let me run this code. As you can see, it works, but it's actually not the most optimal solution. We can actually get this down to linear time. Let me show you that. Is it possible for us to generate the sequence of ugly numbers linearly? Can we generate them in the sequence one, two, three, well, it's three and then four and then five? Can we do something like that? Well, let's go back to the tree view. So here we're at one. So that's already in the tree. And let me actually use blue for this. So that's already here. Well, I guess once we pop it, it's there, or we could initialize it this way, either way. Now we multiply uh, this by two, three, and five, but we don't necessarily add those numbers in that order. Let's add them one at a time. How would we know? Well, this is where we're currently at. So we multiply it by the factors to get these as candidates. From three elements, it's pretty easy for us to take the minimum of those three. So let's do that. We get two. So that's what we end up adding here. Okay, now we could do this. We could say, okay, multiply it by two, multiply it by three, and multiply it by five. And now we have a bunch more candidates to choose from. This is where we needed the heap, but maybe we can be a little bit more clever. Do we really need to consider these two as candidates just yet? Because we haven't even taken, this was the first ugly number, right? And remember the way we uh, generate new ugly numbers is taking a previous one and multiplying it by two, three, and five. So for us to generate three and five, we multiply this number but why should we take this number and also multiply it by three and five we know those candidates are going to be bigger we don't really need to consider them yet so we can keep track of this actually with three pointers one that i'm going to call i2 one that's called i3 and one that's called i5 so i'll draw this a uh, tree at the same time that i show you it here so right now when we started we had i2, i3, and i5. All three pointers were at the first element. But now we've taken i2 and shifted it over here. But i3 and i5 are still at this element. So we actually ignore these for now. So we take this 
multiply it by three and five. So these right now are two of our candidates. And this is the third candidate because that's where I2 is. We multiply it by the number that it's at. So these are the three candidates. Among them, three is the minimum. So this is where we will add the third element to the array. And now we're gonna take that pointer three since that's the one that we just created an element for. The next uh, element that's gonna result with a factor of three is gonna be from this, two multiplied by the factor of three. So that's where I'm gonna put I3 right now. And now this is just kind of how it's gonna keep going. So now uh, we can consider the factor, well, this is uh, done for now. And now we can consider that candidate over here, which was six, because now the three candidates for us are uh, two times two, two times three, and one times five. The minimum is gonna be four. So four is gonna be what ends up uh, being added next. And that was from this value, this factor, two times two. So this will be the one that's shifted over here and I'll add it here. So we're almost done explaining this solution. The only thing I wanna show you is what's gonna happen if we somehow uh, end up with duplicates. We can actually end up with duplicates with this approach as well, but the solution to handling it is actually very elegant. We don't need a hash set. I'll show you. That would occur when, let's say this pointer I5 is at this position and when our pointer here, I2, is at this position. So let's wait for that to happen. So right now, the candidates are this. I2 is at three, so this multiplied by two gives us a candidate of six. So notice how there's two duplicate candidates. So actually, we ran into this uh, case sooner than I expected. Well, right now, though, among all three of these, five is still the minimum, so that's what we're gonna end up adding here. We can finally take the I5 pointer and shift it to be at this position now, it's at two. So now the candidate that will emerge from that is gonna be 10. Now, among these three, we see that the minimum is six. Does it matter if it's this six or this six? Not really, because to here, we're still gonna append a six. Now, you might wonder, well, which pointer should we advance? Should we increment the I2 pointer or the I3 pointer? Well, the best solution would be to increment both, because if we don't, one of these is gonna be left over. And then one of these is gonna be replaced with a bigger candidate, let's say it's eight or nine or something like that. Well, this is still gonna be the smallest candidate, and then we're gonna end up with a duplicate six. That's why we shift both of the pointers so that this candidate is no longer there. So we take the I2 pointer over here, shift it here, and then we take the I3 pointer and then shift it over here. So the new two candidates are gonna be two times four, which is gonna be eight. So that's gonna be from over here. And also three times three, which is gonna be from over here. So now I know this isn't the best drawing, but these are the three candidates that we have and we will still continue to go through them um, in minimum order. It's easy to take the minimum of three different elements. I hope that you more or less understand what we're doing here. And if not, hopefully the code will make it crystal clear. The time complexity of this approach is gonna be big O of N and same for the space complexity. The solution is actually pretty similar to this heap solution. So I guess I will change the name of this to just nums. And when we end up returning, we're gonna end up returning uh, nums at index N minus one. So we are gonna have those three pointers I talked about, I2, I3, and I5. Initially, all of them are gonna be at zero. And then we're gonna go for I in range one all the way to n. This will actually stop at n minus one though. And we're starting at one because we already have the element at index zero generated. So now this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna consider those three elements, the three candidates, which is gonna be what next num is. It's gonna be the minimum from these three, the num at index i2 multiplied by two or the number at index i3 multiplied by three and the same thing for the one at i5. This is the number. This is what we are going to be appending. So nums append next number. But now we need to know which pointers should we increment? Well, whichever ones match the current next number. So if next num is equal to the number at i2 multiplied by two, that means that we just chose the candidate from here. So therefore we should be incrementing the i2 pointer. But it's possible that multiple numbers uh, matched, like this candidate could have been the same as one of the other candidates. So when we generate the other if statements, when we write these out, we're not gonna do else if, we're gonna 
uh, still have it as an if statement because we could have multiple of these execute. So I'm just going to change this to three and also this to three and this and then same thing here except five, five here and here as well. So this is the entire code. It's not necessarily easy to come up with. I think the heap solution is reasonable. And this one isn't super crazy once you recognize what it is, but it's kind of hard to understand how to like approach it and also I guess a little bit of why it works like how do we know that if there is a tie between these that they're going to occur like on the same iteration of the loop well that just comes from the fact that the numbers are generated in sorted order so it's not like we would generate one of the sixes and then another of the sixes afterwards because that would mean that they were generated out of order but you can see that the solution works and it's pretty efficient if you found this helpful check out neatcode.io for a lot more and I'll see you soon